All right, welcome everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. Um, thank you for joining what is a live recording of our quarter tone series. Our special guest is Yassine Al Salman, uh, otherwise known as Narsi. He goes by many names. He is a rapper and musical artist, founder of Irakafella Records, a multi talented, multi dimensional uh, guy who has been an inspiration to me for a long time. He's an Iraqi Canadian rapper. He's currently based in uh, Quebec. Montreal, but is on the road constantly. Narsi, welcome to Africa Quarter Tones. How you doing, Mickey? Nice to see you. It's great to have you. Um, and you, you know the drill. This series is um, based off, you know, like old school radio shows where an artist would roll into town for a few days uh, on tour and go play a little bit of their music, let the listeners understand where they're coming from, but also uh, talk a little bit about their work and where they're coming from. So the way this is gonna work, we're gonna talk for a few minutes and then um, jump into three interludes that we've spoken about before and hopefully have some Q and A at the end from the audience. Sound good? Sounds great, let's do it. Okay, so the, the first thing I wanna chat with you about is you are a professor. <laughs> yes i am i am a professor people don't i don't think a lot of people know this that um you know outside of the world of music and the world of design and and production and touring and thinking about activism you spend your days educating people what what's that how does that sort of like weave into this broader part of your life well you know i learned how to make music at, at Concordia University, having the privilege to be uh, in my early 20s on campus. Uh, I figured like, let me be here as long as I can. You know, I'm, I'm privileged to be in this space, to have, to be afforded the education that's being given to me. So let me make the best of it. So when we used to do our sound project assignments, we used to stay overnight, me and two of my friends, Nawara and Nawaf, and make music uh, at Concordia. And then when Nofi passed away, I went back to do my master's in that same building. And that's where I recorded the, I mixed the Arab Summit album. So I learned how to mix music at Concordia, right? And then when I left and went on a solo career for a couple of years and came back to Montreal, I became one of the, the staple English MCs in Quebec. And there was a guy teaching a hip hop course at Concordia. And he invited me to come be a guest lecturer in his class. And then he invited me to co-teach his class because he wanted to take on more classes. So I broke into the school the same way I broke into like the music game. It was in an unorthodox, you know, I'm not coming through an endorsement, you know. Yeah. Um, and I took over his class eventually and grew it from 17 people to 48 people to 96 people. And now it's 200 people a semester. What's the, name of the, what's the name of the course? Uh, it's bigger than hip hop is one of the courses, and then beats, rhymes, and life is the other course. So, uh, yeah, it's been the biggest blessing of my life. You know, I get to interact with eighteen to twenty-two year olds and see where the world is at and what the pulse is like for the generation after mine, but also like pass down the gems that have been given to me. You know, uh, in a non-orthodox way again, like introduce them to Edward Said for no reason, introduce them to. Uh, Marshall McLuhan out of the blue and see how they interact with it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a bit, it's, it's the, I'm very grateful for that position. I take it, I do not take it lightly, you know? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious how that sort of shaped your, shaped your musical taste and sort of your, the, the palette of your interests, because interacting with 200 young minds every single semester who are, obviously interested in music. It's not like they're, they're taking physics classes with you. They're walking in because they have a deep interest and care and investment in this, um, in this genre. How has it sort of changed your sound and, and what you like to listen to, do you think? I mean, I've always listened to everything. I drive my family crazy because I listen to the loopiest music and then I listen to the oldest music. Um, because I'm a researcher by nature, right? Yeah. But I'm not like a, I'm not like I write everything down kind of researcher. I'm kind of just like soaking everything in. I've always been like that. Yeah. Um, 
But what's interesting about interacting with 18 year olds and, and no, and being aware of the hierarchy that I have and like trying to break that hierarchy with them. Um, the thing I've learned the most is that like, they're having a harder time than we did when we were 18. We had a, we had a very politicized time to live through when we were in those early days of university. It was like the, the world was in a weird place. Yeah. Whereas with them, they kind of, they don't exist in the moment. You know, they, they tell me that they have trouble living in the moment because of the comparison culture that they were born into. Hmm. And an 18 year old wasn't around on 9-11. They were born a couple of years after 9-11, yeah. right? So their experience of a politicized world is like the story that's being told to them. They didn't experience it. So their main struggle is like, how do I both, how do I pay attention and not be anxious all the time? Cause I'm distracted all the time, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, just to have more, more when empathy. You were, yeah. When you were 18, I like how you said it. When you were 18, you were in a, in a weird moment. They're not in the moment. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, they're in a weird moment because they're being extracted from, from the moment, like being present. It's really yeah. like the culture now is very much about like, what are you what are you looking at? What are you sharing? What's the conversation? That's the loop that we're all in right now. Look, it's not yeah. like, hey, how are you? But I'm seeing the shift in that because of their awareness. We weren't aware of what technology was doing to us until we were deep yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah. They are deep in it and they already know what it's about. So I think they're gonna be the shift, you know? Yeah. I hope. Yeah. You know, when I first uh when I first sort of like became uh, more aware of your work it was always through this like family production right meeting sister and sister and other cousin and fake fake brother and a real brother and all, <laughs> <laughs> all these different things um and hearing about this collective that you uh that you run um in collaboration with this family um and then i went back and watched fatwa right your first video and I saw that the opening line is another Sterling Siblings production. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. oh, family has always been part of this since the very beginning. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, what did your parents do? Give me some tips. My, my father was an architect. My mother was... No, uh, I don't mean uh, career-wise. Like, what no, did they uh, do to make you guys um, love each other so much, be focused on the arts, produce together, think about how to support each other is like dreams and careers yeah i don't i don't know you know from from the inside looking in i i do collaborate a lot with family but i i also feel very selfish at times because i'm like trying to i'm the one out of all of us that's always like let me do the next thing let me do the next thing like i'm unopening the box for us you know um and everyone's like yo you need to chill like you're doing a bit too much you know uh so having my sisters around Particularly, I only have one sister, which is Hela, and, and she's my older sister. And she introduced me to much of the pop culture that I first got introduced to. Like, I watched her, you know? A lot of us have that older sibling that we watched, and they gave us the tapes, or we stole them from her their room. Um, and me and my sister have always been collaborative and imaginative. So as we got older, she was doing video work, and I started making music, and you know, she, I was living with her. So we were making the music in, in our home and uh, she'd come up with ideas. So I just like, I don't really mess with people. I find people in the creative industry, very either driven by ego first or uh, what can they get out of the situation? Yeah. So I figured if I'm, if we're going to put anybody on, let's put ourselves on as a family and just hold each other down, circulate money internally when we get grants and, uh, in, a, in a way where you're paying another artist, but you know them and you know how they benefit from it. You know what I mean? Um, and the medium initially was not just family. It was the first year, what we tried to do was have a group of friends work together. Mm -hmm. But after a year and a half, two years, we realized not everybody is going to take initiative for each other. It's very hard. And we didn't want to be the leaders per se, right? Yeah. So we boiled it down to our core family and it just became tighter, clearer, um, safer, um, you know, and more, more. Who else do you want to feed but your tribe, you know? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. 
So uh, I was telling you this before the call and before we get into some of the music, I want to talk about, I want to talk about some of the names that you've had over the years, <laughs> right? Um, not unlike a lot of uh, hip hop artists, na names change, right? Uh, common sense became common. Uh, there's, I mean, there's, there's too many to, to name. Um, but I want to understand the sort of the shift in your music over the last two decades, um, how uh, Euphrates turned, you know, the narcissist, then why that shifted into Narcy, um, if that was more than just a name change um, and sort of a brand change. Um, mm. Can you talk through that a little bit? I think the concept of AKAs uh, came to me through Wu Tang. You know, yeah. Wu Tang was the first that was like they had nine names and they were one person. And it also is like a very comic book thing. So I used to read comic books as a kid, and I loved the aliases, mm -hmm. the different parts of the brain that every character played. So Euphrates was me and two two producers uh, known as Sandhill at the time. Yeah. Uh, they're two brothers who are cousins to my better half, you know, before she was my better half, they, mm -hmm. they used to be uh, my producers. So we were Euphrates. We were a collective. And then when I went solo, because uh, when Nofi passed away, we kind of disbanded the group and, and I went solo. I was always the narcissist within Euphrates. So I just kept that name. And obviously it's all my music is about like doubting. It's about doubt. Like a majority of my music is about doubting the world or doubting yourself or mm -hmm. like, how do you overcome doubt? You know? Um, yeah. So it was a, you know, it was a mirror of that. And, but then I started feeling like when I would walk into meetings, people would be like, Oh, that's the narcissist. And everyone would go, <laughs> and then there would be an awkward, like, wait, that's really his name, you know, yeah. or is he, um, so it started feeding back in itself and people started treating me like I was a narcissist and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't positive, but all my friends would call me Narcy, right? So when I did uh, World War III, which was when I first used the Narcy name, um, I had just come back from the Emirates and trying to start a record label there. And I was like disillusioned with the game even more. And it was like Narcy became this... Uh, rebel this rebellious version of me outside of the music industry like mm -hmm. i'm not following any norms i'm not trying to make singles i'm not trying to uh you know i'm just trying to create a body of work as a as an artist you know um so that's why i chose that and i toy with that i'm always like i feel like a kid like when you look up narcy you find photos of uh like either selfies or uh, Filipino girls, because the name Narcy is a common it's name a in the girl. Philippines. <laughs> so, so I'm like, <laughs> I said just change my name to Yasin, but then most death names is named Yasin. So I'm like, okay, uh, you know. So I'm constantly struggling with a name. <laughs> That's so funny, because you're one of those guys who definitely like flexes the AKAs, right? Yeah, I have a lot of AKs, a lot of AKs. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the sort of the taglines that you you uh, mention all the time is is Rockefeller, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is like one of the like the patented play on words that you're a very big fan of, right? My favorite mm -hmm. one is uh, Dame Din Dame uh, Dish Dash. Up, Dame and Dish Dash, yeah, which is just like uh, perfect. But t tell people what Rockefeller means to you and what this record label is and the merch behind it and sort of the mission behind it. Well, first of all, a Rockefeller Records is it's not a record label. <laughs> a lot yeah. of people think that it's like a real thing, but it's, it's initially was something I used to say in my raps at like 18, 20, 20. It was like a through line. And everybody attached it up to me because I was always the Iraqi guy. Uh, you know, I get books for the internet. The International Hip Hop Music Festival. It always says Canada slash Iraq or Iraq slash Canada. So it, it, I became synonymous with it. And then um, somebody that is a friend of mine had a clothing line, and Ahmed, his name is Ahmed Adeh, and he had a clothing line called Turban Outfitters. And he was doing collaborations with Arab artists to raise money for X cause in the community, right? Yeah. 
So I was like, let's make an a Rockefeller Records t-shirt. Yeah. And when we did it, it sold like crazy. We raised money for kids who needed a, a heart surgery. And then people started calling me a Rockefeller. So it just started growing and the t-shirt ended up on bigger and bigger artists and in like yeah. uh, certain moments. So it, that became synonymous with my music. It became bigger than my music, you know? Um, so I, what a Rockefeller means to me is like, I'm Iraqi, but I never grew up in Iraq. So I'm that fella from Iraq, but I'm a fella. Like I'm, I'm in North America. I'm like, a, I'm a, you know, if I went yeah. back home, like I'm not really, I don't fit in the same as I would have if had I been born there, right? Yeah. So Rockefeller is that East and West. It's like the first half of the word is, is the East. The second half of the word is the West, mm -hmm. you know? And I meet right in the middle. So, uh, yeah, it's just who I am. It's my brand. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that uh, the first time you hear it, you're like, damn, how's that? No one ever heard of it. No one ever thought of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Uh, let's, let's get to the music. So we're going to play three different clips um, and then talk about each one uh, after it. Tell us a little bit about why you chose space as the first interlude before we play it. Yeah, I mean, sp space, space is time. really like a uh, space from the album Space Time. But the, the song that, that you're about to play is the, the snippet of the song Space that I have with um, with Yasmin Hamdan. And the, the way that song came together really finished my album. She was in town. We went to see her show. Then we went to have a drink with her. And I was like, hey, you want to go to the studio? She's like, sure, let's go to the studio. And we played her a bunch of shit and she picked this song. And like the song is about uh, wanting to leave Earth. Not like it's not a suicide song, but it's a, it's like a Escape. wanting to leave. Yeah. Wanting to leave all the troubles that we have around us in, in, the, in this time and this space. Right. Yeah. And she and she came in like the alien, like the way I envisioned it is like this alien that comes down and like teaches you about Earth and shows you the beauty around you again. So yeah. it's one of my favorite songs that I've been a part of, and it doesn't have my vocals on it, but it's uh, yeah, it's an experience. All right, so we're gonna play a little bit of it. Um, let's hear how it goes. This is halfway through. <laughs> Would you die for me? Make it right for me. Is it alright if we take a flight for free? You're a sight to see. Someone as bright as the night. I see the moon in your horizon I just wanna go to space I just need a little space I just wanna live in space Shout out to Lebanon. We shot that in Lebanon. Yeah, that's yeah. in Tripoli. Yeah, man. 
Um, I was about to ask you uh, why you cho chose Tripoli for, as a location. You know, it's it's crazy because uh, I had recorded this song with Mashru'a Layla and it was such a beautiful experience to, to work with them. Um, like we were sending stems back and forth for like a week and we got that song done and it was such a... Uh, it was so like a seminal to the project that I was like, I have to shoot the video for this song. Right. And I, yeah. and I had to, and it happened like overnight. I was in Dubai. I had a conversation with a friend of mine. She was like, Oh, we can easily get funding for something like this. Got funding, flew to Lebanon a week later, put the concept together and found locations and talking about family. As I was leaving Dubai, my sister was like, Oh, you should shoot at this location. And she sent me, um, she sent me a website with photos from the, the, the fairgrounds fair. and I was like, I was like, what the, what, what is this? Like, and she did it so like in passing that she forgot that she did it. Yeah. Right. So when I got to Lebanon, we went and visited it. Uh, we drove to it the, the second day that I got there and I was like, this is it. Like, this is the video. So I, I basically like scouted the location and then we went back three days later and shot there, you know, so beautiful and sad at the same time. You know, is that so? That's not your voice. That is my voice. Sorry, I thought we were gonna play the the part with um, Yasmin, but that was my voice. Okay, amazing. I'm, yeah. Do you mind if I play a little bit of the part with Yasmin in the beginning? No, of course. It's a, it's not in that video though. Oh, it's not in this one. Okay, all right. It's not in the it's not in the music video, but it's in the audio version of the song. I mean, uh, okay, we'll come, wanna, we'll come we'll come we'll come back, back to, to it. it. We'll come back to sure. it because we, we got a, a bonus track at the end of this too. Um, sure. uh, just before we move on uh, on space, when you what was the sort of reception like on space time? How do you even sort of think about an album like this that is really different than uh, the other projects? I mean, with this album, I really wanted to be as as real as real as I could be. Like as much as like uh, when I was working on this record, I was thinking about my kids. Like if they if I could give them a book of how I felt at a certain point in my life, this one would be it. You know, the messages in the song, the, the meaning of the song, the order of the songs, the visuals, the packaging of it. Um, uh, it was like a departure literally from my old stuff. So uh See, man, as, a, as an independent artist, you have to trick yourself from looking at numbers and reception. Because as soon as you start looking at that, you start comparing it to other people, and then it, it kind of destroys the work. So with this album, my main mission was like, I just want to do some really dope shit visually and sonically that's undeniable and do it outside of the industry and not try to get awards for it or apply for anything. I just did it. You know, um, and I was very grateful It kind of, in a way, it kind of um, solidified my journey for myself. Like I was like, OK, I know I can do this, you know, yeah. so what else can, what else can I do, you know, um, and I was just embarking on like a visual production and like directing journey. So it was the first music that I did from a visual perspective. So. I'm, gra I'm grateful, bro. Every every time I get to finish an album, it's like, alhamdulillah, I lived long enough to finish an album. Yeah. <laughs> they take so much out of you as an individual, you know? Yeah. Are you are you the type of guy that, because um, I feel like there's like two broad clusters of creatives. They're the, there's the creatives that have hard drives worth of stuff that they'll never send anyone. No interest in it. Right. They make stuff save. That was for me. Right. And then there are people like me. Right. That's the second group. That's like share immediately. I, I'm trying to decrease the number of moments from new file to share, like hit record to hit send. That is my main modus operandi. Right. Um, are you are you in it for the 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 share? I mean, I, I create a lot. I have a lot of ideas that I can't. Yeah. I don't have time to put out into the real yeah. world, you but know. You, but you so, wish you could. I wish I could. I wish I could yeah. do more. I need an. I need another me. Yeah. Uh, but also, I'm. I'm not a. I don't rush to put stuff out. I like stuff to to feel good and look yeah. good. 
if, before I put it out. So I'm the type to like, I've realized that if we're talking about musical projects, I do it in three clusters, you know? I do a first like burst of work and then start mixing that work, then do a second burst of work. And within those two bursts, you'll get like a third of the album. Mm -hmm. And then you come in and do the final run and then yeah. you mix it. And then people tend to hear it two years after. And I like doing that because you can make a song in the moment and be like, yo, this is the shit. Like, this is my best fucking song ever. And then you, <laughs> if you burn yourself and put it out and look back at it two years later, you're like, what was I thinking? Yeah. Uh, I don't like being that kind of artist. So I like to sit with a song and if it still feels as good as it felt when you had the aha moment a yeah. year later, then it's a keeper, you know? Nice. Okay, we're going to do uh, the second interlude. Uh, this is a song that you uh, are on with Mos Def, Yassin Bey. Uh, it's called A Tribe Called Red. Um, do you want me to play a little bit of it now? Or you want to talk about, give a little bit of an intro before we play a little bit? Yeah, this is probably one of the most important moments in my career. I got to, this was the first music video that I ever directed myself. Um, I got to record a song with, with who one, you know, an MC that's in my top five MCs who was in my top five MCs before I met him yeah. and we became friends, you know, and, and developed like a respect for, he, he respected my work, which meant a lot for me as an artist, but also to have the privilege to go to South Africa and shoot a video and be given the responsibility to shoot a video for what might be the most important indigenous group to come out of Canada in the music industry in the last like 10, 15 years, a Tribe Called Red. You know, they had such a huge impact when they dropped and they're such, so important. And to be, to have the responsibility to deal with the Arab community, the black community and the indigenous community working together, mm -hmm. it was my greatest honor, you know, in my career so far. So, um, that's that's R E D man, a tribe called Red. All right, let's listen to a little bit of it. Confronted by the Ally Nation, Alien Nation, the subjects and the citizens see the material religions through trauma and numb. Nothing is related. All the things of the earth and in the sky have energy to be exploited. Even themselves, mining their spirits into souls sold, into nothing is sacred, not even their self. The Ally Nation, Alia Nation. on planet earth the currency is murder you a man of worth they say the day is coming drumming that you can't reverse watch the banner burn before the cannon burst don't chase an illusion the nation halusa hallelujah taste of the future the people the shower the pistol the coward the face of the future lonely martyrs magic carpets dirty blankets coca-cola soul controller holy waters middle east mode sand glorious Cheat code in Babylonian the Orient. <laughs> My superhero got the people power. Yasin and Yasin, you should heed the hour. With you and living kings, I mean it, I mean. I mean it, I mean. Yasin and Yasin in the R.E.D. I mean it, I mean. Original nation with one son of the I mean. Solid with it. True and living. Amazing. Um, thanks for sharing this. Um, what's it like watching these things? Uh, 
this video in particular, I, I feel no bad feelings when watching it. I just feel, I just smile because it's like, <laughs> I can't believe that happened, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, um, but it's also surreal, man, because it, it makes you realize that like I manifested a lot of things when I was a teenager listening to rap with my headphones and not talking to anybody and just visualizing. Like I visualized that experience before we even shot it. I, I don't know how to explain it. But when I was on the ground there, the, uh, you know, I was reading a book today, uh, a Deepak Chopra book, as, as corny as that might be to some people. But I, I was, uh, and he was saying like, the, the best way to manifest is when you let go, right? And like when you don't expect the result, and then it comes to you. That was one of those experiences where I, I subconsciously put that into the universe. Like I'd love to work with X and X and X. And when I was in South Africa, there was so much serendipity that was happening. I was only there for three days in Cape Town, you know, yeah. but we navigate, we navigated it so easily and everybody was telling us it was going to be so difficult. And when we landed, Muhammad Ali passed away and there was all these like, Wow. A Muhammad Ali moments that happened. That's why the, my friend is wearing a Muhammad Ali shirt in the video. Mm -hmm. Like, it was one of those moments in my life that's like, uh, I don't know how to explain. There has to be a, a higher power, you know? Uh, so I'm, so I'm forever grateful. I want to talk to you about two things. One is, did you guys write the verses side by side? Or, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, because you guys are referencing each other. There's like some yeah, I mean that's it. That's him. Black star like, moments. Yeah, yeah. That that was that was most. That was Yassine. Like he was in Montreal. Yeah. I I introduced him to Tribe. Then the next year he was in Montreal again, and they happened to be in town, and we got on stage together at Oshiaga just like haphazardly. And then the studio session was set up another time, and we were all in town at the same time. And we spent like six hours in the studio, you know uh talking for a good like four hours and as we were talking i was writing down things that were said yeah and that be that became my verse and yasin went in and he had a he had this long verse and he just he just sang the hook it was like it just you know it didn't become about anything but this moment which was why i love that song so much yeah. what's it like to sort of befriend an idol like that a childhood idol and sort of understand their humanity and understand that they're not the, you know, the black star cover <laughs> that they're more than this sort of two dimensional thing. What's it like? The amazing thing about being friends with Yasin is that he has a lot of, he has a lot of uh, insight on like uh, spiritually battling with creativity. Right. Uh, I haven't spent much time with him. I wish I spent more time with him, but I, I think I met him at a time where he was talking to me a lot about like the, 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 the pain of like visual, uh, like attaching visual persona to artistic creation and like how hindrance that can be to artistic creation. And he was like undoing, undoing his like Hollywood persona. And he wasn't interested in the industry anymore. And it really yeah. shaped how I approach and I'm in no position that he's in, but it, it shaped how I approach like the spiritual elements and the struggle that I have with a lot of the game, you know? So he became a, a conversation, a person I have a conversation with about this a lot. And then he introduced me to so many other of other of my, like other idols of mine, like Chappelle and Kuali and uh, that whole community. I got invited in because of his trust, you know? Um it was the right person. It was the right person to show me the light of the darkness, you know, because there he, I, I, I saw a lot of myself in him. So I'm forever grateful that the people that I got to meet with him and through him shaped my journey even more as I kept going on it. You know, he, yeah. he's uh yeah, he's a great brother. I love, I love Yassin. You know, it's, I feel like there's this like among a lot of the, uh creatives and, and thinkers and writers um, in, in, the, in North America, and I guess in Europe too, but in North America, um, who are Arab um, and, and or um, a Muslim. 
um, religiosity is a, is like a very sort of unifying experience, obviously, right? And it's interesting. I feel like a lot of a lot of my favorite hip hop artists uh, who are connected to the Arab world in some way in the in the West are very religious, <clears throat> and almost none of them in the in the Arab world are religious. Mm. Um, and but they're of the same ilk. They're they're like soulfully connected, right? Yeah, they I think, think it's the real. They share the realness. They share like the honesty in their work. It's the, this shit is not about money only. It's about like yeah. we need change. Like there's an urgency to our world. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I mean, I, I'm like, uh, I wanted to understand like how how much you sort of because you are of these two worlds too, right? You spent half your childhood. In, in the Arab world, half your childhood um, in, in, in Canada, and you're back and forth all the time, right? Like you've just shown us all these clips. How, how easily do you connect with these, uh, how easy is it for you to connect with uh, somebody in the Arab world um, who is 0% religious, um, but is of the same sort of, of the same uh, ilk and sort of perspective as you as is it as easy as connecting with somebody like Moses? yeah i mean listen I, you know i i don't i tend to like try to shy away from religion and and focus more on the the connection to something bigger than me mm. and whether we're talking about yasin or kuali or or uh, dave or hamid or carl or you know, anybody or Yasmin or anybody from my collaborators, that's what they all believe in. Yeah. Something bigger than us. Because in all the through lines and all the, the artists that I've worked with, every artist that I've collaborated with has experienced a struggle related to oppression. You know, whether it be through a colonial force or a religious force or a structural force, there's there's this shared experience of like there's an injustice in the world and and we gotta shed light on it even if we yeah. don't talk about it in the music our work sheds light on it you know yeah um, so that's what I think it is I think that everybody believes in a in a in a grander story and that's how we've connected and I don't force I try not to force collaborations anytime I've tried to force a collab with anybody uh, it doesn't feel genuine so the ones that you've seen have all been like, these people are my friends. Like Hamid is a friend of mine. Yeah. I check, I check in on, you know, I check in on these people and, and, and yeah. like we check in on each other outside of music, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's it. I think that's the through line. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Let's, let's do the, the last one, which is thoughts and prayers. Um, give us a little bit of an introduction as to why you chose this as a something that be, might, might be fun to, to listen to. And yeah. So after space time, you know, I went into space and came back and I started <laughs> thinking about the, like the digital space that we're sharing and my work with Joey, thanks Joey, all the work, whether it's meme against the world or thoughts and prayers so far has been about the internet. Right. Mm -hmm. So this, this song, this song is about the irony of like, uh, you know, selective sympathy with communities um, but also the dangers of meme culture and uh, a deep fake technology and like where the digital world might be taking us, just the fears that I have, you know? So it's a, a bit of a tongue in cheek chorus about thoughts and prayers. My thoughts and prayers are with you, you know? Yeah. This, this is your black yeah. mirror, black mirror. Evening. This is my, this is my black mirror moment, my brown mirror moment. <laughs> hey guys. My name is Yasin, but I'm commonly known as Narsi, and I'm going to tell you how to make a million dollars. You know how I did it? Why are you trying to skip the ad, man? Uh, I'm trying to give you some game. Actually, this is not an ad. Stop trying to skip it. Just watch the whole f***ing video. I didn't monetize this thing. Support independent artists. Like, what's wrong with you? I'm broke. I never made a million dollars. Smoking soon, might have to hang this mic up soon, like Um Kazoom. Salam. Trumpets blow for the pulpit's doom. I need my flowers right now, all pulled in bloom. Shukra. It's just meme against the world, baby. Looking at this bad news will make you stir crazy. Can't even gather up the words lately. Thanks. I mean, what I'm trying to say is, uh, oh yeah. You got my thoughts and prayers. It's where the fingers too short to unbox your fears. Uh, I do this for my co 
culture here and my culture there so they know what it looks like when you ultra rare and the truth is clear nobody even really cares anybody here it's fuck a dollar in the stream understand what i'm saying yeah you ain't got the answer Deep fake on a love conveyed These days you can't trust a face All your posts online They got me judging things All fly temptations for the lust and beings Churches burned down, we can bust with wings What does it mean to discuss these things? <laughs> I can see you in VR color You can have it if you change your AVR color Whole world with the eye on us Scroll down, slow down, don't die on us Feel like we moving at a mile a minute Can't end another night without some violence in it Follow your heart, watch closer than the algorithm Can't be behind a fall out of rhythm Whoa. Okay, amazing I want to leave a little more time for, uh, for yeah, sure. the, the last EP This is brilliant um, This is a lot of fun uh, Do you perform this stuff live? Yeah, yeah. The last tour that I did with Masra Leila, uh, this was the last song that I would do. So I have a very visual show, mm -hmm. um, which I keep in mind when I'm making videos for sure. Yeah. So um, did you direct this one as well? Yeah. I mean, as much as you could direct a deep fake video, I did all the, I picked out all the clips on YouTube and shot a green screen version of my face so that the the, the artist who, the fakening, the artist who does the deep fake technology stuff could use it. So I have, I have so much more deep fake of myself that I didn't use. Um, but it was amazing to direct a video this way. You take your favorite movies and just put yourself in them. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Just uh, pull the curtain back a little bit. Um, how easy is it to do this? I mean, did you just like go on uh, like Fiverr and find a, an artist who no, could do no, this? Like, what's no, the so, so like? I, I, I knew about the fakening. I didn't know who, who they were. I just, I knew about their work. I'd seen it online. Yeah. And then um, I, I hit up, I hit them up online. I was like, yo, I really want to do a deep fake music video. This is how much I can do it for. I'm an independent artist. And uh, it was such a nice organic process. They were like, yeah, sure. Let's do it. And I, after I did this video, a lot of people worked with the fakening and, the, and yeah. I'm, I'm sure yesterday's price is not today's price. So like I got, I fell in a pocket where I could do it. And I got the video, I got the video back a week later and I edited it in a week and I put it out the week after that. So it wasn't that difficult, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I want to uh, have you uh, play a little bit from the latest uh, sort of extra we got an extra sure. clip. so play a little bit from it and then we're going to do some quick uh rapid fire questions sure let me uh let me try can you guys can you hear me yep i got you okay so i could play a song off the rockefeller album that i have coming out next year um there's a lot of songs in here let me see what i could play you um I'll play you the song that I have with Ziad Rahbani and um, uh, P Thug from Chromio. Nice. Who's coming up? Who's coming up on the series soon? Happy, my 
dear brother. Hope you stay mindful of the words that you utter. Some of you navigate in a world like a cutter. Better to society, feel sorry for your mother. What a wonderful earth that we live in. It. Are you gonna stand up for yourself or are you giving it? Another man only has the power you give it. Him. Tell your people that you love them. Don't hold on to the sentiment. I love you like I love my land. I love you like I love it sense. I love you like. Kings on kings, they need to stay gone. Give away all of that privilege they were free. Sure. That's it. Is that Chromeo on the ver on the chorus? And there's a little Yeah, man. Amazing. So uh that is obviously you on the verses. Is, is that P Thug on the little sort of uh chorus outro? P Thug on the chorus, he played bass. He played mm -hmm. a bit of key. Joey flipped the Ziad Rahbani sample. We kept mm -hmm. Rahbani's vocals on it. And then we hit up his team and uh, it got to him and he liked it and was like, yeah, just, just feature me on it. So, Amazing. and it, we got connected to Ziad through, um, through Habibi Funk. So it's a, yeah. a whole bunch of Habibis involved in, the, in this project. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So you... You know, I've heard you say in other interviews that you love to do as much as possible, right? Like involved in design, involved, obviously, you're writing your verses, you're directing video clips. Um, I haven't heard you talk about producing. Um, do you like that process? But you just like also working with folks, um, other other pro producers like Thanks, Joey? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a very technical producer. I'm mm -hmm. more of like a... a an analog producer in the sense mm -hmm. that I think, you know, if I think about strings, I go get string players and then I tell them what to play. And we, instead of sampling them, we just get live instrumentation. So my production has always come at the, at the second half of the project where I work with beat makers. And then if you listen to all my albums, the through line in them is, is there's one, one uh, string player that's on all my albums, Jacob, and then um, a, a key player from Montreal called Calder. So like, I go to them, they record, I edit and, and then mix the project. So yeah. I'm like, a, I'm that kind of producer, you know? And I love that process because it, it's like telling the story through, through these players that have been a part of my journey the whole time, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I love music production. I always do like two or three songs on my albums on my own. And then the rest is like co-produced by me, you know? All right, we're gonna do this rapid fire question real quick. Um, what song or album always makes you smile? Fulfilling this first finale by Stevie Wonder. Is there, it, which one? I didn't, I didn't catch you. First finale by Stevie Wonder. Is there a, a album that you listen to no skips? Stevie's album that you listen to no skips? Yeah, that one, there's a D'Angelo Voodoo. There's yeah. uh, the miseducation of Lauren Hill. Mm -hmm. There's uh, so many, so many. Okay. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Mm. For like a regular day or like a work you day? Choose. You choose. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, if I could time travel, probably my grandfather in the 50s, you know, but if it's in the present, uh, so many, so many creatives, like a, a Christopher Nolan while he's shooting a movie, you know? Tell me about it. For yeah. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? That I'm like super Muslim, super political all the time. <laughs> So yeah. when they see me rocking expensive sneakers, they judge me for it. <laughs> That's basically it. What artist from the past would be your dream collaborator? Wow. Uh, I mean, you know, I would say Michael Jackson, but I don't know how that would work. Because um, I'm not Michael <laughs> Jackson. 
but uh you know i'd love to be in the studio with like abdul halim and his whole band you know that's like a dream you know um that's it N not too many people i'm you know i've worked with i've worked with who i want to work with amazing okay so let's uh we have two questions in the chat the first one is from ahmed ahmed if you want to turn on your camera and unmute yourself you can go for it how's it going man it's such a great uh talk and so good to be here with you both uh, Narcy, I'm curious about the role of, you mentioned through your classes, you kind of get a pulse on what's happening, what the kids are up to, uh, but I'm curious about the zeitgeist in general, how that, you know, influences your work, uh, and maybe ways that maybe it's a distraction or a hindrance to what you're trying to do. No, I mean, a lot of my work is a reflection of what's, you know, I consume a lot of information. So a lot of my work is like processing that information for sure. You know, I'm very in tune with like, Sundas always makes fun of me because she says like, she'll tell me something and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. She's like, oh, you know, finally I found something on the internet that you haven't read before me. I'm always like on time. So um, no, of course, everything influences my work, especially teaching, because I have to be aware of what's happening in the world. You know, I can't be disconnected and just be reading out a book. Like I want them to, I want to connect, you know? Amazing. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, Ahmed, you're up next. You can unmute yourself. There you go. Hey. Hey, guys. Uh, Narsi, I love you. Um, I have two questions. One is for Ha'aud. Is it about going back home to Iraq or about building a community in the West for you, Canada, or like finding inner peace within that space? Or is it like a physical Ha'aud or like, yeah. And I live in New York. So when I listen to that song, I'm very paranoid. Someone's going to open the door being like, we're where are you going back to? You know, you're staying here. <laughs> yeah. um, that song was sent to me with, with Hamid's vocals already. So I based my verse of, uh, on the confusion of like, where am I going back to? Maybe I should just live in this, you know, at the end of my verse, I should just live in the sound, you know? Like that's where I should be residing. So it's really about just returning to myself at the end of it all, I think. And not really holding on to the idea of having to be in one place at all the time you know yeah um awesome. yeah and the thanks second, Ahmed. oh did, go for it yeah did kanye west actually facetime you the other day and what did you guys talk about Would you <laughs> no it's a, it's a it's an instagram for uh like a filter you guys should it would be an amazing song it would it would be it's a, it would be a dream come true one day we were talking about this earlier actually all right thank you okay. Thanks, Ahmed. Okay, uh, Tala. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, I just have a question. Yeah, so as a creative, what is your priority when making your work? And like, what's the purpose that drives, to, drives you to make what you make? Because um, I'm interested because I'm also like a visual art, like I'm a visual artist. So like, it's always interesting to see artists purpose behind making their work. Um. I always just want to like expand my ability. So I've always seen like, if we're talking about music or visuals, it's like I, I put it all in a universe. So when you look at all my work, I want it to all fit in this like world that you visit, you know? Um, so to make sure that there's like self-referential stuff in there that if you're a fan and a listener, you'll catch. Um, Obviously, there's a cult cultural purpose of just like sharing my story in a way that I would have wanted to hear a story from an Arab artist when I was younger, like leaving breadcrumbs for the next generation. And then just to enjoy the process. Like that's one of my main intentions is like, as soon as this starts feeling like it's forced, then I shouldn't be doing it, you know? Um, that's it. Set your intention before you start. I think that's always very important. It'll, it'll make the process that much easier because there's no pressure then, you know? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tala. Thanks, Tala. Okay, Narsi, I'm going to ask you the final question. And I'm not going to put you on the spot. So I'm going to, I'm going to guess your top five and you're going to tell me uh, if I'm wrong and correct me if you'd like, okay? Okay, uh, like rappers? Top five yeah. rappers? Top five dead or alive. Okay. All right. You kind of hinted one. So Moe's, 
Nas, Ye, Big, and Meth. My top five rappers are Mose, yeah. and there's no particular order. Yeah, of course. Black Thought, mm. Orin Hell, mm. Andre 3000, and Nas. Those are my top five. Oh, very good choices. Very, very, very good choices. And I think three quarters of them are Gemini's. <laughs> well, so Lauren is, Andre is. Um, Andre, Lauren, uh, and, and no, and the other three aren't. So let's say two, two, third, two fifths. Two fifths. Pretty good. Pretty good odds. Um, well, listen, Narcy, this has been really, really a pleasure. Um, everyone, look up Narcy wherever you look things up. Uh, it's easy to find him online. Check out the new album. Um, this was a huge thrill for me. Thanks for making the time. Thank you for sharing your space with me, for doing a fikra in the first place. You know, I think it's such an important initiative. And, and uh, yeah, man, I appreciate you. Thank you for the time you gave me. Anything you need from me, I got you. Thanks, man. All right. Peace and love to everybody. We will see you soon. Uh, we got another event tomorrow and probably one the next day. All right, everybody. This will go up on YouTube and on podcast in a couple of days. So check that out. Peace. Thank you.